Hi everyone, welcome to class on Christology. You're ready for our class? Yes. Okay. Uh, last week, we looked at um, the week before that, I mean, class, our first class, we looked at what is Christology. So, a student of Christology will basically study what? A student in Christology will study. Okay, the humanity and the divinity of Jesus Christ, how it coexists in perfect unity in the person of Jesus Christ. Sorry, somebody was saying something. Okay, what else will we study in Christology? Okay, so we prove the, the deity of Christ. To prove the deity of Christ, what will we be looking at? The His pre existence of God. Okay, thank you, Kofi. What else? Pre existence of God, what else? To understand that Jesus was truly human. Okay, we look at also the humanity of Jesus. Uh, but first, we will look at the divinity of Jesus. So, for to prove that Jesus is God, we prove His pre-existence. What else? Nature and attributes of Jesus Christ. Okay, the nature and the attributes of so the form of God. That is morphe. The Greek word means the nature, the characteristic, the attributes that make God God. If we prove that Jesus has the nature of God, we prove that He is God. So, we looked at that. What else? Yes, his equality with God the Father and, and God Holy the Spirit. Holy Spirit. Yes, thank you. Okay, so the first uh, lesson we looked at his pre existence. We looked at some scripture passages. What are some of the scripture passages we look for the pre existence of Christ? John 1 1 to 3. Mm -hmm. Okay. John 8 58. Thank you, Nelson. John 1.14. John 1.14. Thank you, Warren. Philippians 2, 5 to 7. Our in-person students are saying Philippians 2, 5 to 7. Colossians 1.17. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry? Revelation 21, okay? Okay. So we looked at various scripture passages and we're trying to prove from scripture and, uh, you know, prove that Christ is divine, that he is God. We proved his pre-existence from scripture. We are looked, last um, class we began looking at his equality with the Father and the Holy Spirit. So to prove his equality with the Father, we looked at all of these scripture passages that we had studied. So we looked at John chapter 1 verses 1 to 3. What else did we look at? Philippians chapter 2 verses 5 to 7. Thank you. John 8, 58. Thank you. Yes. And then we looked at the titles that are ascribed to God the Father. What are some of the titles ascribed to God the Father? That Jesus ascribes to himself? The mighty God. The mighty God in uh, Isaiah 99 6. Everlasting Father. Everlasting Father. Okay, that is ascribed to God and is also ascribed to Jesus. But what are some of the titles that Jesus ascribes to himself, which is ascribed to God? Alpha and Omega. Sorry? I am. Okay, I am. Thank you, Andrew. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry, Kofi, we didn't hear you. Alpha and Omega. Yes, thank you. Alpha and Omega. The first and the last. Yeah. Besides him, there's no God. So that is what God the Father 
reveals about himself Isaiah chapter 44 verse 6 Isaiah chapter 48 verse 12 the same thing we see Jesus ascribing to himself in Revelation chapter 1 verse 8 and uh, like Joseph said Revelation chapter 22 verse 13 okay and um, we look at um, uh, two more scripture passages in the New Testament uh, where it talks about Jesus uh, his being eternally God who's overall but before that I would like to look at this passage of scripture that's not given in your notes uh, but something that Jesus um, another uh, you know passage in scripture very important where Jesus proves that he is equal to God the Father that he is God any idea where the scripture passages in the Gospels where the Pharisees were so angry that they took the stones to stone Jesus because it was blasphemy, because he was claiming to be equal with God the Father. Okay, this is John chapter? Uh, no. It said, uh, before one. Abraham was, I am. Okay, that is one place, another scripture passage. John chapter 5. Okay, look at, uh, please turn to John chapter 5. Uh, verses 1 to 15, okay? In this passage of scripture, Jesus is where? Where is this narrative taking place in John chapter 5? Bethsaida, the pool of... Yes, the pool of uh, Bethesda, Bethsaida, okay? And um, uh, Jesus goes there and there are many... People who are paralyzed, invalid, lame, you know, lying there for the mortar to move. How many people does Jesus heal in that place? Only one. An invalid man who was invalid for how many years? 38 years. Okay. And Jesus tells him, pick up your mat and walk. So this man is so excited. He's healed. He picks up his mat and walks. And what do the Pharisees, when they look at him, tell him? Yeah, it's a day of Sabbath, and how dare you pick up your mat and walk? They're not, it's so sad, right? They're not happy for this man who cannot walk for 38 years. They're more bothered about the law that he's broken about taking his mat up and walking on a Sabbath. And they said, Who? Uh, he says, I don't know. The man who healed me told me, pick up your mat and walk. And they ask him who this is, and they don't know, he doesn't know who it was. Okay. And later on, Jesus just slips out in the crowd. Later on, he finds Jesus. And Jesus tells him, go leave your life of sin, right? Um, where is, yeah, uh, verse 14. You know, it says, go and leave your life of sin, otherwise something worse will come upon you. And then he realizes that it is Jesus, and he goes and tells the Pharisees that it is Jesus. And so they are very angry with Jesus, and they come to Jesus. And what does Jesus say? They ask him, how can he do these things on the Sabbath? What does Jesus say? Look at verse 17. Can somebody read verse 17, please? If you're reading it, please use the mic. Otherwise, our online students can read. There's no mic for... Okay. John chapter 5, verse 17. But Jesus answered them, My father has been walking until now, and I have been walking. So it says, My father is always at his work to, to this very day, and I too am working or my father has been working until now and i have also been working okay so we see that you know um jesus is equaling himself with god the father okay and he's calling god as his own father and this angers the pharisees very uh, greatly okay um look at what jesus says in verse 19 We can read from verses 19 to verse 27. Can somebody read that, please? So Jesus answered them by saying, I assure you, most solemnly I tell you, the Son is able to do nothing of himself. But he is able to do only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does is what the Son does in the same way. The Father dearly loves the Son and discloses to him everything that he himself does and he will disclose to him 
greater things yet than these, so that you may marvel and be full of wonder and astonishment. Just as a father raises up the dead and gives them life, even so the son also gives life to whomever he wills and is pleased to give it. Even the father judges no one, for he has given all judgment entirely into the hands of the son, so that all men may give honor to the son just as they give honor to the father who has sent him. Amen. Thank you. So here we see that the religious leaders are already angry with Jesus because he's done this miracle on a Sabbath. Now to, he could have, you know, smoothened out things, but instead of smoothing out things, he's adding to the controversy. He's adding to the controversy by claiming himself to be equal with God, by calling God his father. So by saying that God was his father, Jesus was basically claiming that he was equal with God the Father in terms of his nature, in terms of his privileges, in terms of power. Okay. So for example, if you say that so-and-so is your father, you're basically saying, you know, you possess the same human nature as him, along with all the other qualities that describe your not your earthly father or your earthly dad okay so likewise when jesus was claiming that god is his father he's claiming to possess the same divine nature as god himself okay along with all the other divine attributes and um, so the jews they understood that jesus is saying that hey i'm equal with god the father look at what he says in, in in the same chapter in verse 21 he says for as a father raises the dead and gives life to them even so the son gives life to whom he he wills so now the jews are saying hey we know only one person who can give life and who is that or who raises the dead and who is that god and so when jesus is saying that he also can give life He's saying that he's equal to God the Father, which means he is God. Okay. So the Jews understood that God only had the power to give life. And now Jesus is claiming he had the same power as God the Father. Look at what he says in verse 22. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the sons. And here again, the, Jesus knew that the Jews knew that God alone was the one who would judge the world. My, and by Jesus claiming that the Father has given him this privilege, you know, they are so angry with him. So how can you say that you are God when you are just man, when you're born here on this earth? So why does Jesus say, because all should honor the Son just as they honor the father verse 23 why is jesus saying all of this he's saying hey i'm saying all of this because you need to honor the son just as you honor the father and jesus goes on to say he who does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent me again he is getting the jews very very angry why because the jews believe that only god had to be honored and worshipped you know, to the extent that the Jews never even gave honor and respect to the rulers and authorities. The rulers and authorities like Nero and all of these, and Caesar and everyone who ruled Rome, they were act, they would work, act like gods. You know, they would be they would want uh, to be ascribed the title of savior. Okay, uh, if you look in in the Roman history. Okay, and they would be, uh, you know, deserve, they deserve, they looked at themselves as people who deserve the position and the honor, respect of God. And uh, the, for Jews, that was something they did not tolerate. They would just not respect and honor their leaders. One reason why, because they were already, you know, treating them very badly and imposing great taxes, and also because they had to worship and honor only God. And when Jesus is saying, and claiming the same right to be worshipped and honored as a father, you know, they, they are even more angry. And Jesus is actually saying this to emphasize the unity that he has with the father, the unity between that exists between the father and the son. 
So he's saying what is done to one should also be done to the others because we are co-equal. We are equal because we have the same nature, the same attributes. We are God. We are co-equal. Okay. Um, in John chapter 14, verse 28, Jesus says, You've heard me say to you, I'm going away and coming back to you. If you love me, you would rejoice because I said, I'm going to the Father, for my Father is greater than I. Okay. So now some people say, how can you say that Jesus is co-equal with the Father when Jesus himself says in John chapter 14, verse 28, for my Father is greater than I. And some people use this verse and say, hey, hence we can prove that Jesus himself is saying that he is no, he's not co-equal with God the Father, and hence he is not God. He can be an intermediary God, or he can be a prophet, or he can be someone as a mediator between God and man, but he is not God, because here he says, for my Father is greater than I. So what does Jesus mean when he says, the Father is greater than I? Or he is a little less than the Father, in other words. What does he mean? Hello, what does he mean? Have you ever thought of it? Yes, Lucy? No, mm ma'am. -hmm. What does Jesus mean when he says that? Now, what we need to understand from this verse is Jesus is basically describing his role to the Father and not his nature. By nature, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are co-equal. They have the same nature, the same attributes, um, the same essence that makes God, God. But here, when Jesus is talking that God the Father is greater than I, he's describing his role to the Father and not his nature. Okay, they have different roles. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit have different roles, but their nature is one. They're co-equal, three persons of the Trinity, but they have different roles. And we can understand this in our context, in the context of marriage. Okay, in the context of a marriage relationship, you know, um, we read in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23, that who's the head of the family? The husband is the head of the family and the wife has to submit to the husband just like the church submits to Christ. Okay, so here are we talking, uh, are they, uh, is, does it mean that in nature the husband is greater than the wife? No, only in role. Why in nature they are not uh, you know, they are not different, but they are co-equal because of what we see in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. You know, God created them. What do we read in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27? God created them, male and female, and he created them both in his image. That means both are co-equal, okay? We also read in uh, Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, for God there is no Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, male nor female, but all are one in Christ Jesus. So when we're saying, hey, in a family, who's the head? The head is the husband, okay? Husband. So in God's governmental structure in the family, who is the head? The husband. In God's husband. governmental structure in the church, who is the head? Christ. The Christ. But when you look at it in the earthly way, it's the pastor, right? And I'm, I'm not looking at it in the whole spiritual sense, but in the governmental structure I'm talking about, in God's governmental structure, you know, in God's governmental structure in the workplace, who is the head? The pastor. Okay. Uh, in, your, in, in your workplace, who is the head? In the manager, the boss, the CEO of the company. Okay. So, so we have God's governmental structure in various areas of our life. And God has appointed the 
head. It does not mean just because your boss is the head in the office, he is greater in you by his nature. No, we are co-equals. The same way, pastor is the head in the church, but the same nature. They're all created okay, equal in Christ. The same way in the marriage relationship. So here... Uh, we can look at the marriage relationship, of course, in a very dim reflection of the persons of the Godhead. Okay, They're co-equal in their nature. They're co-equal as eternal persons of the Trinity in their divine nature. They're co-equal in their attributes, in their essence. They're co-equal. But when it comes to their role, the Father is greater than the Son. Okay, that is what we need to remember. Very important. So why I'm pointing out the scripture passage in John chapter 14, verse 28, is because when you go and preach and teach to people and say, hey, Jesus said this in John chapter 8, verse 58. You know, he in Revelation chapter 22, he ascribes himself to the same titles and the names given to God the Father. And in John chapter 5, you know, he's proving he's co-equal with God the Father, that he is God himself because of, um, you know, he can judge, he can give life, and he deserves the honor and the glory that is ascribed and the worship is ascribed only to the Father. And somebody can say, wait a minute, and point out to John chapter 14, verse 20. Hey, here it says Jesus himself is saying, you know, the Father is greater than I. Then you have to talk about greater in terms of role, not in terms of nature or attributes. Do you all understand? Yes? Okay. So, um, another two places that we can... This was not in your notes, but I'm just explaining because a very important passage of scriptures. I thought I could use that and explain it to you. Other two passages of scriptures that are given in your notes where we can prove that Christ is overall, that he is eternal, is Romans chapter 9, verses 4 and 5. Can somebody read that, please? It's in your notes, Romans chapter 9, verses 4 and 5. Can someone read? Online students, anyone? Lucy, go ahead. Yes, sister. Romans chapter 9, 4 and 5. Who are Israelites to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God and the promises of whom are the fathers and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is overall the eternally blessed God. Amen. Thank you, Lucy. Here in, in Romans chapter 9, verses 4 and 5, there are two important facts that we see about Jesus Christ. What is the first one? Jesus Christ is the last phrase. Eternally blessed God before eternally blessed God. The last Who is phrase. Overall? Who is overall? Thank you, Warren. He's over all. Okay. He's over all. And oh, what does it mean when we say he's over all? He's above everything, yes. Master, master yes. king. Master, king, lord, sovereign, supreme, supreme in authority, supreme in power. Okay, so he's overall, which means he's supreme, the authority, uh, he's lord, he is master. Okay, what do we understand by this phrase, which Paul says, eternally blessed God? Eternally blessed God means, eternally means what? Forever and ever, okay? Yeah, right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Kofi? Yeah, forever and ever. Forever and ever, thank you, Kofi. Sorry, you were saying something? No beginning, no end, from eternity to eternity. And he's the one who's worthy to receive all honor, blessing, glory because he is God and he's co-equal with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. Okay. Uh, a last reference we can look at is Titus chapter 2 verse 13. Okay. Can somebody read that please? Looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you Warren. So looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, 
Jesus Christ. So here they say, uh, here Paul is writing to Titus and he's saying, uh, Jesus is our great God. And so they, we cannot deny the fact that Jesus is God, that he is deity, you know, uh, because scriptures reveal very clearly to us that Jesus is God. He's not demigod. He's not a mediator, intermediary between God and man, but he is God himself. Okay, so we looked at various scripture passages that prove to us that Jesus is co-equal with God the Father. We will look at one scripture passage that talks about Jesus being co-equal with God the Holy Spirit. Okay, uh, let's look at John chapter 15 verse 26. Can somebody read that please? John 15, 26. John chapter 15 verse 26. But when the helper comes, whom I shall send to you, from the Father, the Spirit of Truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. Amen. So here Jesus is saying, you know, um, when I go back, I am going to send you a helper. Now Jesus is telling the disciples, hey, I'm going to go away soon. The disciples are very, very sad. Uh, they're, they're feeling lost. They're feeling disappointed. You know, by Jesus saying, hey, don't worry. You know, when I go back to the Father, the Father is going to send you the Spirit of Truth, okay? Um, I shall send you the Holy Spirit who comes from the Father. He will testify of me. So look at uh, the equality in terms of origin. Okay, where did Jesus come from? Where did Jesus come from? From the Father. Jesus says, I've come from the Father. I'm going back to the father is very clear about that so look at where he's saying the spirit of truth will come from from where from the father, from the father. Okay. yes from the father so note the equality in origin okay and also note the equality in terms of unity okay the spirit of god comes from the father and is going to reveal jesus christ to them so in operation there's unity there's oneness between the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, even though they have different roles, okay? Now, for us, it can be confusing to understand. We are trying to understand this infinite God with our little small minds, our little understanding, okay? But for God, there is no confusion, okay? So it's a confusion. Some people ask me, ma'am, uh, who do we know when to call? No, in which instance or circumstances should I know to call God the Father or God the Son or God the Holy Spirit? You know, so it can be something like a big question mark for us, but for God, it's not confusing. Hey, who's going to Nelson's need? Who's going to, you know, uh, John meet John's need? For them, between them, there's no confusion because there's, there's oneness, there's perfect unity, there's this one God. Okay. But for us, we are trying to comprehend and understand. Trinity, so we have all of these questions, but for them, there's perfection in their operation, there's unity, and there's oneness. Yes, Warren? Uh, just a quick one, sister. So on this point, uh, I've always wondered, you know, because when we pray, normally we say, we, we'll, we'll open a prayer to dear Father or dear Father God, but then we say, thank you, Jesus, praise you, Jesus. So, uh, you know, I've always wondered, because are we doing the right thing by doing that, or can we just call one God and it, it refers to everyone? Um, they're not going to get upset if you say, you know, God, the uh, uh, Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. The Father is not going to get upset or angry. Uh, the Father is not, when you, when you say, thank you, God, and we worship you, Jesus, we, we praise you, Jesus, the Father and the Holy Spirit is not going to get angry because uh, there is perfect unity in them. When you're just talking to God the Father, you're talking to Jesus, you're talking to the Holy Spirit. When you're calling on the Holy Spirit, you're actually calling upon God the Father, God the uh, son okay so just the uh, just the one god so they are not going to uh, be sad you don't have to be uh, you know trying to figure out who to call who to say you know uh, if you find that a little mind boggling little confusing you can just say god that's more than enough you know sister when we <laughs> pray and close our prayers we say in the mighty name of the lord jesus christ we pray amen and how does yes. that uh... how does it apply yes. uh it applies because um you know we are not worthy to come before god 
uh, and uh, when Jesus died on the cross, the veil of the temple was torn into two and we have access. So we can, like Hebrew says, we have, uh, we can come before the throne of grace with confidence to receive grace and mercy to help us in our time of need. Where do we receive this grace and mercy? Because of what Jesus has done on the cross. Oh. And who is our great interceding high priest? Hebrew says it is Jesus. Jesus okay. So Jesus is our great interceding high priest. So even, so if you say, we ask this in the name of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we're basically saying, we're basing this prayer not on the works that we have done, not because we are qualified, we have nowhere to stand, but because of what Jesus has done on the cross, because he has made that full, sufficient, perfect sacrifice with which God the Father was pleased, which which God the Father was said, there is no more need for any more payment for the remission of the forgiveness of sin. So we're standing on that. We're declaring that. So that is why we say, uh, we ask all this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you, sister. Does, yes. Does that help, Warren? Yes, thank you, sister, really. Okay. Okay, any questions on chapter 2? Equality with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit? Any questions? Nelson, you have a question? No? Any questions, Cyril? Bless you, sorry. You have any question? No, okay. Sorry. Any questions from our online students? Okay, there's no questions. We'll move on to chapter three. In chapters one and two, we basically study the deity of Christ. We establish the fact that Jesus is God by looking at various scripture passages that point to his pre existence. In chapter two, we looked at his equality with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. And we looked at various scripture passages to establish that. Now, in lesson three, we will again look at another aspect that will prove to us that Jesus is God. And what is that? What other aspect can we look at uh, to prove that Jesus is God? That he's a creator God, right? That he's the one who created everything that we see. He was there, you know, even before creation to bring about everything. So by doing so, we look at various scripture passages that prove to us. By doing so, we see that Christ is the creator and hence, we will prove again that he is deity. Okay. So in this chapter three, we will basically briefly be looking at Christ's role in creation. Okay. Uh, we look at, um, again, this familiar passage of scripture that we began looking at in chapter one and chapter two. And that is, what is the familiar scripture that we John, looked at in John, John chapter one? John, John, one, 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 three. <laughs> okay, sorry, yes. Okay, gave out the answer. In chapter 1 and chapter 2, thank you, all of you who said John chapter 1, verses 1, 2, 3. So we already looked at, uh, in the beginning was the Word. Okay, so he existed even before the foundation of the world, even for the creation of the world. We saw that he was equal with God. He is God because he was with God the Father. And the word was God. And all things were made through him. Verse 3. So everything that we see in creation was made through him. And without him, nothing was made that was made. Okay. So uh, again, this... Worse, you can prove that Jesus is God, that he is creator. He created everything. Uh, John chapter 1, verse 3. Another important scripture passage is Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 18. Now, Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 18 has been called the great Christology. Okay? Because it sets forth Paul's inspired no, it's inspired by the Holy Spirit in, and it's an inspired conviction and understanding of just who Jesus Christ is. Okay. And in Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 18, Paul basically highlights uh, several unique characteristics that qualify Jesus Christ uh, to be the preeminent one uh, who is supreme over all 
things. Okay, he's supreme over all things. And there is no other passage in the New Testament that lists out so many characteristics that points to Christ's deity as it's, we see in Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 18. And that's why it's called a great Christology, because it's revealing the, uh, the, the person and the work of Jesus uh, in, the, in, the, in the following verses as well. And also it's talking about Jesus' humanity and uh, divinity. Okay, uh, Because in this short, powerful scripture passage, you know, it presents to us the supremacy of the person of Christ in relationship with God. Verse 15, we see in verses 16 to 7, his, uh, 16 and 17, we see his relation to creation. And in verse 18, we see his relationship with the church. And some of these things that I'm saying are not in your notes. So maybe if you have to look and write down, it's good. So we look in and study in depth um, Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to um, 18, which is called a great Christology, a very powerful uh, uh, scripture passage, uh, which we can study, we can preach, we can teach about when it comes to establishing the deity of Jesus Christ. So can somebody please read Colossians chapter 1, um, the deity and the humanity of Jesus Christ. Uh, so can somebody please read Colossians chapter 1, verses uh, 15 to 18, please. Now he is the exact likeness of the unseen God, the visible representation of the invisible. He is the firstborn of all creation. For it was in him that all things were created, in heaven and on earth, things seen and things unseen, whether thrones, dominions, rulers, or authorities, all things were created and exist through him and in and for him. And he himself existed before all things, and in him all things consist. He also is the head of his body, the church, seeing he is the beginning, the firstborn from among the dead, so that he alone in everything and in every respect might occupy the chief Please. Amen. So what are some of the unique characteristics that, um, you know, we see about Jesus Christ here? The first one? First one before that? He's the image of the invisible God, which means he is God becoming man who we can see. So you know, God who we cannot see, who is invisible, but he's the image of the invisible God. The second thing, he's the firstborn over all creation. The third one, yes, the creator of the universe, which means creator means the architect, the builder, the goal of the entire universe. The fourth one, <coughs> What's the fourth one? He sustains all of creation. Okay. The fifth one. He's the head or the sovereign of the new creation. Who's the new creation? We all are the new creation. So we are the church, right? So he's sovereign or head of the new creation, which is the church. Sixth one. It's not there in your notes, okay? So what's the sixth one? Look at this, the passage in scripture. He's the firstborn from the dead. Okay, and the seventh one? The preeminent one over all things. So would you like to just maybe uh, highlight it in your uh, Bibles or write down the points? The first one is, is the, he's the image of the invisible God. Okay, image of the invisible God. The second one, the firstborn over all creation. Firstborn over all creation. The third one, he's a creator of the universe. The fourth one, uh, th uh, yeah, the fourth one, he's a sustainer of creation, one who sustains creation. The fifth one, he is the sovereign or he's the head, he's the authority over the church, which is a new creation. 
He's the sovereign or the head of the new creation, which is the church. The sixth one, he is the firstborn from the dead. He's the firstborn from the dead. And the seventh one, he is the preeminent one of all things. And if you look at verses 19 and 20, it also talks about the work of Christ. It just, this, this passage does not just talk, Paul is not just highlighting the unique characteristics of the person of Jesus Christ. Also is talking about the work of Jesus Christ, where in verses 19 and 20, he says, in verse 19, he says, For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood, which he shed on the cross. So it's also talking about uh, salvation here. So here we see that, you know, there, and, uh, you know, there's no other passage in the New Testament that lists so many characteristics that point to Christ's deity that is found in this short, powerful passage. And I told you it presents, it, it presents a supremacy of the person of Christ in relationship to God in verse 15, talks about his relationship to creation in verses 16 and 17, and in verses 18, it talks about his relationship with the church. Now, we'll just study each of these phrases in detail, okay, so we can understand. You know, the first one is he is the image of the invisible God, okay? So Paul is basically asserting Paul is basically saying that Christ is nothing less uh, or he is the exact and the unique image of the invisible God. Okay. Now, if you look at this word image in Greek, it basically expresses two concepts. This word image basically expresses two concepts. It uh, expresses the concept of representation and manifestation okay all this is not in your notes so maybe if you want to make down take down notes you can so this word image you know expresses two concepts representation and manifestation okay so um image an image can be a representation okay um uh, and you know like for example you say you know what is your goal in life you know, my goal in life is to represent Christ. That means to be Christ wherever Christ has placed me. Okay. So a representation can sometimes be faulty, can sometimes be perfect enough. Now, when a representation is perfect enough, it becomes a manifestation. Okay. So Christ Jesus was, Jesus was a manifestation of God the Father. He manifested God. That means manifestation means an exact representation. Exact representation. Now, I my goal is, uh, you know, purpose in life is to represent Jesus Christ. But I have my own weaknesses, and sometimes I fail, and most often I fail to represent Christ. So I'm not an exact manifestation of Jesus Christ. Okay. But Jesus, when we say he was the uh, exact image of the invisible God, means he was a manifestation. He was perfect God. So this is a perfect manifestation of God, which means, you know, by looking at Jesus, we are exactly looking at God himself. When we look at Jesus, his nature and attributes, his works, we're looking at the exact nature, attributes, and the works of God himself. Okay. Um, so Paul uses the word, he's the image of God. Uh, and Paul is using the, in Greek, when you study the Greek language, a very rich language. So you need to study each word in different tenses. Present tense, present future tense, present past tense, you know, uh, all of that. And when you study all one word in the entire tenses, the, 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 the meaning of that word and the meaning of that entire phrase comes alive and is so powerful. What we read in English is just, just a very minute, uh, uh, what do you say, 
minute translation of what is there in the Greek. But when you study the Greek, it's so, so rich. So here, uh, you know, uh, the Paul uses the present tense Greek word, which stresses that Christ is always, so when you translate it in the present tense, this word image of God, you know, it actually means Christ is always and everywhere the manifestation of God. So he's not just the image of God, which is, oh, he's the image of God. No, it means he's the exact representation. It means he's the exact manifestation. It also stresses that Christ is always and everywhere the manifestation of God. So the very nature and the characteristic of God is very perfectly revealed in Jesus Christ. Okay. In him, the invisible God becomes visible. Okay. Both the old and the New Testament make it very plain to us that no one has seen God and no one can ever see God. Okay. But John chapter 1 verse 18 says, The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father has made him known. Right? John chapter 1 verse 18. The Word became flesh and we beheld his glory. And verse 18 says, The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father has made him known. So this is the meaning of the word image. So when somebody says he's the image of the invisible God means he can, we can, they can say, hey, he just looks like God, but he's not God. But you need to ex explain to them he is the exact manifestation, the exact representation of the manifestation of who God is. So Christ is always and everywhere the manifestation of God. The second one, he is the firstborn over all creation. What do we mean by this? He's the firstborn over all creation. Sorry? He was in the beginning. He was in the beginning, okay. He was there before the beginning. He was not from the beginning, but he was in the beginning, right. Okay. Now, when you look at this word firstborn, the Greek word is protokotos. So when you look at this Greek word protokotos, it means firstborn, but if it if if and it does not mean first created. Okay, it does not mean that Jesus was first created than all of us. So if it if it was Jesus was first created, then the Greek word would be prototesis. Okay, the Greek word is not prototesis, which means first created, it means that he is firstborn. Okay. Now, if you look at this Greek word protokotos, which means firstborn, and not prototesis, which means first created, it means it has two connotations. Okay. The word protos means first in time and first in rank. Okay. Uh, protos in the English means first. Okay. But it means your first in time and first in rank which implies first in priority and first in sovereignty. Okay, very interesting when you uh, study the Greek. So here, uh, firstborn, so somebody can say, hey, he's a firstborn of creation, which means he was born first, then all of us were born. But you need to tell them, hey, it's not that he was first created in terms of the Greek word prototesis, but he is first born. The Greek word is protokotos, and protos means first in rank and first in time, and which implies first in priority and first in sovereignty. So the first born basically denotes two things of Christ. Okay, which means he's a firstborn, means he's precedes the whole of creation. He's before all of creation. So when you say that, uh, you know, priority, the word priority, first in priority, priority, the other Greek, the other English word is precedence. So he says he's, uh, you know, uh, he precedes the whole of creation, which means he is before all of creation. And when we say that he's sovereign, means that he's sovereign, means he's supreme, he's absolute, he's uh, independent over all creation. So the word firstborn implies that Christ 
precedence to all of creation. Priority means precedence to all of creation and means sovereignty over all creation. So sovereignty, rank, sovereign in rank, head, supreme, authority, rank. So proto, first, first in priority, first in rank. So it means first in uh, that he precedes all of creation and sovereignty means he is over all creation. Okay, uh, I hope it was a very interesting uh, study of Colossians chapter 1. We'll continue to study. Anyone has any questions? Are all of you able to understand me? All of you with me or it's going two way above your heads? No? Okay, thank you, Lucy. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Shaker. Okay, uh, there are no more questions. Uh, we'll end class here. Sorry, Warren, you had your hand up. Okay. Sorry, it was a mistake. I wanted to see a thumbs up. That's it. Okay, thank you. Uh, we are going to miss our next class that is on Friday because of CLC. So I'll meet you next Tuesday and then we will miss the following Friday as well because it's 26. So I'm going to miss two classes, but we will look at what we can do best. Okay, have a blessed week, everyone, and see you next Tuesday. Thank you. Thank you.